welcome to episode five reflection. Woo! That's so satisfying. <laughs> this morning, the, there was an awkward silence for approximately four and a half seconds before one person. Woo! I was like, just let it die next time. Just, I just want the awkward silence to just hang forever. Because that's sort of entertaining to me. I don't know why. Anyway, so tonight, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're going to do our reflection on episode five. We're going to have some discussion. But first, you guys know what we do. We're going to do our challenge recap. So last week, we asked everybody, what is one thing you can do this week to minimize and focus on externals? And what is one thing you can do this week that will instead embody God's heart and heart of love for people? So how did that go? Did you remember to do it? Did you not? Fill in, the, fill in the blanks that I'm not saying. Turn to somebody close to you. Find somebody who's not close to you and become close to them. Go. Then let's get started. Let's get started. So today we are reviewing some of the material from our official chosen study guide and some of the material from our spiral bound workbook, just a little bit. And then, like I said, we will dive into our team of discussion. We're gonna start by talking about mercy. So the verse that is that chapter 5 is based on in the official chosen study guide is Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now mercy is one of those words that we use all the time in the Christian context, but that we sort of interchange with all of the other words that we use a lot, like grace or forgiveness or love or kindness or tender heart and we just sort of use them all interchangeably now part of the reason for that may be that we see a lot of these words in scripture either showing up in lots of different contexts or we see them showing up in lists and so it's hard for us to get a really clear understanding of what the meaning is and indeed sometimes it's not necessary for you to have a super super clear okay so is this is this God showing his mercy, or is this God showing grace? And you're like, probably, yes. Like, yes, <laughs> probably just all of it all together. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about defining what mercy is, just so we can sort of know what we're talking about here. Uh, or perhaps it may be easier to start with, what is mercy? What's the opposite of mercy? So what mercy is not is whenever you demand justice. Whenever there is a wrong that is committed, and you say, the punishment must be demanded. You have to enact justice. Mercy, in its very technical sense, is withholding punishment that is justly deserved. And so, whenever we think about God's mercy toward us, we think we are deserving of God's wrath. And he, in his mercy, withheld that wrath from us. And in his grace, that's that undeserved favor, he gave us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Now, again, in scripture, that idea of mercy is a little bit broader than that because it also seems to involve a sense of compassion. Uh, oftentimes in the New Testament, whenever we think about Jesus showing mercy or having uh, this word of hearing, we see the, the word that's used is talking about the, his bowels, the, the, like there's something with the bowels, and you're like, what? When, remember, in this time period, uh, the bowels were the seat of emotion. And so if you're thinking about, okay, well, if, if something is stirred deep within, then whenever Jesus, for example, sees somebody who comes to him with some sort of affliction, and he is moved, then it's that deep pity, that sense of, oh, something is wrong, and it shouldn't be wrong. And it's that desire to want to help. And so uh, these two things together, being spared some type of punishment that should have been exacted, and the idea of compassion, are these two ideas coming together uh, whenever we're talking about mercy. Now, in order to be merciful, therefore, we have to, first of all, again, as I, as I talked about in my prayer, um, have in mind what we ourselves have been forgiven up because otherwise you're going around and you're saying you you sinner what are you doing i'm going to smack you with this club of the, the, the law because you should be living up 
to the standard, and you're not. And so, justice must, must be enacted. But if you have received mercy, then it is so much easier to look at somebody else and say, well, God's been merciful to me. Why should you be any different? I wish that mercy would be bestowed upon you as well. Now, I wanted to take a look at a couple of things that were mentioned in the official truth of study guide. If you want to, you can turn with me. You don't have to, though, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple of lines here. Starting on page 86. I hear pages turning, so I'll give you a moment to turn there. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Because coffee is the life. Jesus is life. Coffee helps. <laughs> Again, page 86. So on page 86, they, the official chosen study guide talk, starts talking about religiosity. And they focus on Shemuel and the other Pharisees who are slightly misguided in their attempts to, to follow the law. Uh, toward the bottom of the page, um, they say, Truth is, it doesn't take a black robe, like the Pharisees wore, to be a Shemuel. By our very nature, we judge others harshly, hold on to grievances, and sometimes even cease to associate with people we deem unworthy of our time or attention, and often in the name of religion. And they say, which for Christians is fully ironic, considering it was our desperate need for God's mercy that drew us to him in the first place. And again, they're, they're highlighting the key thing that we need to keep in mind whenever we're thinking about trying to show mercy is that when we forget what God has done, that's whenever it's easy for our hearts to become hardened and for us to want to be that exacting, judgmental, self-centered, not forgiving person. Now, on the next page, I really appreciated uh, what they say here. Um, on page 80, I guess two pages over, page 88. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of lines here toward the middle of the page. They were more likely to punish when people broke the rules than they were to show mercy when people repented. A little later on. In the hands of sinful men, God's laws became cudgels of power used to elevate some and shame others. To wield God's way like a hammer. Religion like that doesn't move people, it repels them. And when we're thinking about mercy and living in our world today, I think that's one of the hard balancing lines that we walk, is that we don't want to let go of God's truth. And especially when the, the, the culture is raging so fiercely and pushing for us to compromise and to just give in, to say, oh, well, I guess it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't really affect me directly if, if you are involved in this relationship, even though, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, it's not God's word, but it's not. I'm not going to say anything, but, but, uh, and then you, you sort of back down farther and farther. So we don't want to let go of God's truth. But how do we approach people? We approach them with a sense of mercy and compassion, saying, look, when you do, hey, I'm not going to whack you with a baseball bat, like they said. But it's that the attitude of humility, knowing from, from where we've been rescued. And again, approaching them with that sense of truth and compassion balanced together that allows us to more effectively with people. It's not a guarantee, because people's hearts are hard, and people's hearts are deceived. But like we talked about last week, um, we don't want us to have a bad sense about us because we're unkind, but because people are genuinely either attracted to the message or that they're not attracted to the message. Speaking of sin, we're going to slide over to the Spiral Bound Workbook, on page 105, we have a couple of questions talking about, uh, again, that scene with the demoniac, where he says, hey, there's, like, there's, this, there's this scent about you, there's this feel about you, I, I, there's, just, there's just something that I don't like. And it's because the demon inside of him is reacting to and this is a little bit, you know, we're like, oh, a little bit weird. But the demon in, in the episode is reacting to Simon the Zealot's interaction with Jesse, who is just interacting with Jesus. And so this is sort of like, doo, 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 doo. Um, What's that game where they're like, seven layers of human beings? Yeah, that one. I was, I was, I knew that somebody, somebody would know. Um, 
where it's sort of removed. But it's the same, same idea where, hey, do we, whenever we go into the world, have an aroma about us, like it says in Corinthians, where people interact with us and they say, oh, there's something different about you. I can sense it. I can feel it. I don't know exactly what it is, but, but there is something different. And so, um, before we talk about question nine, I'm going to read question eight at the very top of the page. I was looking at the second half of the page, and I'm like, this is not what I wrote. And then I was like, oh, there's, this, there's a whole other top of the page. So, um, thinking about, again, this idea of being smelly. Does this tell us anything about how the world should feel about us believers? Consider James 4.4. 4. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And again, this is one of those lines that we walk because we are said, okay, well, no, we're not going to live as hermits. We're not going to live in caves. Okay, we get that out of the way. But we have to be in the world without being of the world. We don't want to be caught up in the world's pursuits, in the ethos of the world and the, the, the way that they think, and it's so easy to get infiltrated, um, even in seemingly small and silly ways. Like, I know a big one for me is that I'm ridiculously impatient. I'm so impatient that whenever I, for example, get leftovers out of the fridge, I won't microwave them, because even the near miraculous power of the microwave to heat up my food in literally a minute is too long and i'm like i just need to eat it right now and so that right now mentality is something that has secretly crept into my soul and it is very hard to sort of shove back out and so whenever we're thinking about being friends of the world it's easy to get even a little bit deceived because the the world system creeps in through so many different doors and so many avenues and it's it's really easy for us not to notice. Whenever it's not big and blatant, you're like, well, no, I'm not holding, you know, seances in my living room, and I'm, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm living the Christian life, whatever. But when we really closely examine what we're doing day by day, we're seeing how do we spend our time, what do we prioritize, what do we spend our time thinking about, how do we treat other people in the grocery line, whatever, then we may start to see some influences of the world system creeping in, where previously, if we just sort of scoot along, and we have a, a cursory glance, we would say, oh, no, I'm doing great. So, in, with that all in, in mind, think about question number nine. How does the world feel about you? So if you were going to step into the world, were they, would they look at you and say, oh, no, you fit, you fit in pretty well? Or would they say, oh, well, there's something, there's something off. There's something different. And so the, the real question is, how can you become more smelly in a good way? We're going to move forward to page 111 of the Spiral Bound Workbook. And it's really, it's pages 110 and 111. Uh, but question 25 talks about um, Jesus having everything that he needs, but that he wants Simon the Zealot. So it's not that he needs him somehow to fulfill his plan, but that he just wants him. And um, thinking about who needs who. Does God need us no. to accomplish his plan? Yeah. No. No. Do we need him? Yeah. Obviously. Obviously. But I think that's one of the things that is so cool about our God, is that he, he doesn't just want to to accomplish things because if he wanted to accomplish things he would just do it and we would be done but he wants that relationship with us he really does like he really 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 does <laughs> he sent jesus down to earth to die for our sins to open the way so that we could have a relationship with him he doesn't just whenever we accept him as savior whoop, right up to heaven why? Because he wants to develop that relationship with us. He wants to use us. He wants us to learn to follow him, to serve him, to love him, to help others to find that love of him. And it's so cool. It's so cool. So anytime we think about um, 
well, does God, uh, does God need us? Obviously not. But does he want to use us? Yes, he does. And that's, to me, that's, I, it's wild because you're like, well, who am I? Like, really, like, who am I to God? But it's also comforting because I think, well, if I totally, totally mess up, God's still God. And he can, still, he can, he can accomplish his plans about me any day. Um, at the same time, that's balanced out by uh, the realization that he did place us in the world with the ability to freely choose. And so whenever I think about possible paths, there are ideal paths and there are less than ideal paths. And knowing that God has orchestrated it, Again, thinking about like that, that train that train that's going down the plan and we're operating within the, the, the train cars that you know I can spend the trip dangling out the window, repeatedly running my arm under the, the train the train wheels, right? Or or I can be doing things that are of service within the train car, right? And so either way I'm gonna get to the destination, but that journey is gonna be very different depending on the choices that I make. And so um, that sort of helps balance out the, okay, well, I want to be focused and I want to be listening because I want to serve him well. But again, it's that comfort of knowing that in the end, he's got it. Cause, cause he doesn't need me, but he chooses to use us. So that's great. So now we're going to officially launch into our discussion time. So I'm going to once again come down. I don't know why I did this to myself, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna come down. I'm going to slide over to our challenge. Uh, so the question on page 112, question 27, asks, when have you wandered from the Lord? Did someone help you find your way back to the Savior? If not, how might your story have been different if someone else had intervened? And uh, this question leads into our challenge question, which asks, who in your life has wandered from the Lord? Or who doesn't know the Lord in the first place? and needs to be brought back, or needs to be brought to the Lord in the first place. And then, specifically, what action is the Lord calling you to do in order to help bring them back, or to bring them to the Lord in the first place? Uh, it may be praying, or it may be something a little bit more active. Physically active. Prayer is active. Don't discount prayer. But what's the Lord calling you to do, specifically? So that's our challenge, our homework, quote-unquote, Am I checking this? No. Will it help prepare you for evaluating episode six? Yes. So it's going to be our spiral bound workbook, pages 112 to 125. I went up, I reached out and touched my book and then didn't hold it up. This one, the spiral bound workbook. I'm like, you can't see it on the podium. 